Biggest honor is being nominated for a Grammy, Tony, or an Emmy. I would say a Hugo, my proudest nomination, actually. <laughs> I came from your father just to say bonsoir to the king to the twelve. We's the best. Say more. I was rapping, acting, teaching, and reading a lot, and like not really invested in the separation between those things. Did you guys meet at Hamilton, or how did you guys meet? A toast to you. This is funny. I don't I talk about this publicly that often. <laughs> hey, family, bienvenidos. Welcome. We've got a great show for you today. Now, back in 2015, the musical Hamilton became probably the biggest thing on the planet, sold out every show, racked up Tony Awards, seemed to make its stars superstars overnight. And in fact, today, we've got one of those stars, David Diggs. Now, he found fame as a Tony Award-winning performer, playing the dual roles of Thomas Jefferson and Lafayette. Now, he's Emmy-nominated for that same performance, while also starring in the acclaimed TV series Snowpiercer and creating the new star series, Blind Spotting. For more, this is David Diggs. Hey, David. Hey. How are you? Doing well, man. How are you? Good. Who is that little one there? This is Luna. Let me this see. One, let me one see one Luna. Our, one of our dogs, Luna. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> she rarely likes to be on video. She's not much. That's not really her vibe. But she probably wants to go outside. Where are you living now? My house uh, that I live in with my partner that I love is in Los Angeles. Welcome to our home. Come on in. Come in. Moved into this house two years ago. This is kind of where we do a lot of our reading and, and hanging with our friends. And I nap on there pretty often yeah. on this yellow couch. <laughs> did you guys meet um, at Hamilton or how did you guys meet? Yeah. Yeah, we, she was in the ensemble in the uh, on Broadway. Right. She would later go on to open the West Coast tour. A toast to you. So she actually was Angelica in San Francisco. And then when it moved to LA, that's when she had taken over that part. How did magic happen? I'll, this is funny. I don't, I don't talk about this publicly that often, I don't think. You know, the original company on Broadway, they were still building the show. So we all kind of did whatever we wanted. Things weren't as set as, I didn't understand how, how Broadway musicals work once they become tours, but they really like go on to set the show that happens on Broadway and try to recreate it, at least in terms of like the travel patterns of the characters and stuff. If you are learning the Lafayette track and the Woman 5 track, you will find that they intersect at like a hundred places in the first act. And that's just because I was trying to stand next to Emmy. <laughs> I would just find excuses to be close to her on stage. And that's now become like part of the show that other people have to learn. But we were just hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man, I love the adjustment. Now, were you an Oakland kid, a Berkeley kid, or did you get a taste of both? All of the above, I was very much like a, a Berkeley kid, but also spent a ton of time in Oakland because my dad lived there. So I always had one house in Oakland and one house somewhere else in the in the Bay. Bring it back to the Bay. Then I'll bring another one back to the Bay. Show the whole game how to act in the Bay. Squad stacked in the Bay. You can hate, but you can't ignore the facts in the Bay. I had great parents who always encouraged me to like find things that I enjoyed and then continue to go towards those things. So that's just sort of what I grew up knowing how to do. When I was in preschool, uh, I, we were supposed to do like a, like, a, like a performance for the parents and I didn't want to do it. My mom talked to the teacher, she came back, she said, you don't have to do it, but you have to do something. And I said, I want to do a gymnastics routine with my dad. And, uh, and a couple days later, my dad showed up with me in matching rainbow tights, and we did this gymnastics routine in front of the parents at the, uh, at the preschool. And the important thing about that story to me is that, um, it, one, my mom gave me permission to do something that everybody else wasn't doing, and two, my dad supported me and made it possible. And I think... Um, Always just kind of an artsy kid um, with, like, a lot of imagination, but who was like really shy and didn't have a lot of friends. Were you shy, but, but comfortable with yourself? I don't know that I'm comfortable with myself. I, I, I think I've always been pretty accepting of myself, <laughs> you know, good. but yeah, like, yeah. I definitely am uncomfortable in my skin. I remember as a kid 
be just nervous, like always nervous. Like I've had friends describe me as as an introverted extrovert, and because I do, I like being around people, and I've always liked it. I like big groups of people, and really, what when, when I discovered performing, like that was the the reason I stuck to that is because it gives me a reason to be in the room with a lot of people. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We fought for these ideals. We shouldn't settle for less. These are wise words. Enterprising men quote them. Don't act surprised, you guys, because I wrote them. Yeah, I used to be uh, friends with uh, Josh Redman, who's a wonderful yeah, jazz musician. Mother was Jewish, father black. And as I got to know more and more people in the East Bay, it feels like there has been kind of a rich tradition of those kinds of couples. Did, did you, <laughs> were, were, were there other kids like that? I wasn't the only like mixed Jewish kid that I, that I came up around. And so it didn't dawn on me that there was anything out of the ordinary about that until I left the Bay Area, you know, like people in college were like, you're what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I definitely was not the only person at Temple Beth El right. uh, with a Jewish mom and black dad. Tell me just a little bit more about your mom. I hear her name is Barbara. She's from Haskell, New Jersey. She came to Berkeley at the end of the 60s, 69. She ran lights at the Berkeley Rep Theater and then she went to Europe for a while. She was ran lights on the first uh, European tour of Fiddler on the Roof with Zero Mostel on there. If I were a rich man. Came back to the Bay um, with a DJ, and apparently, according to my dad, they used to line up around the block. She played the best music in town. She got her PhD, and then she ran the Child Welfare Research Center out of UC Berkeley. She probably did more good as a DJ than she did in all of her years kind of creating policy, because at least she made people happy on the weekends. <laughs> I mean, if I had met you in high school as you were heading off to college and asked you, what do you think you're going to do? Did you have a vision and, and what was it? I knew I was going to be an artist of some sort, but I actually, so I went to Brown University. I was rapping and acting and teaching and reading a lot and like not really invested in the separation between those things. Like I, I was aware that a lot of people saw these uh, activities as separate, but they weren't to me. It all felt the same. I was able to approach all of them the same way. Like I approach character development in much the same way I approach writing a song, which is like understanding the story first and then finding the ways that your performance or your writing or whatever are useful in furthering the story. I wish I knew the roots of these skinny digit splinters, these protruding lips that chap in the winter, this bulbous nose that makes me sniffle through prose, I must be a dead ringer for someone's dead finger ring. What was nice about college is like, I learned a ton of techniques of all sorts, writing techniques, acting, I learned so much theory and I couldn't, I didn't know how to use any of it, but I learned a lot of it. And then many years later, when I finally started working professionally, I would say, oh, that's what that meant. Oui, oui, mon ami, je me fais la the Lancelot of the Revolution, I reset. I came from afar just to say bonsoir to the king to the twelve. We's the best. Say more. What's the biggest thing you learn uh, from doing blind spotting? Telling stories that are important to you and to your community is a really powerful thing. You can't catch me, I'm on too fast on the gas, don't chase me. Put him up like this, you got him. I'm a tough guy. I'm if you are telling something very personal, um, you get to be the expert in that, which means when somebody tells you that something can't be done, you get to say you're wrong. If we're making a show that has where, where that has like a four minute dance piece in the middle of the episode where there's no dialogue and it's a 30 minute TV show and somebody says you can't do that, we get to say you're wrong. Because this, because I know that this represents the emotion of this moment. When you look back, it's probably when people said you're wrong that like art forms get to leap forward a little bit. That give the rest of us who were like, I w didn't know you could do that permission to do that. I'm David Diggs and I've got something to say. I'm tired of worrying whether or not you will like it. I'm tired of tripping off whether somebody gonna buy it. I got a lot to holler, some bad, some good. Keep listening, you'll witness something. Working with your friends is a really powerful thing. Me and Raphael, 
creative blind spotting together like we you know we were making music for many years before we started writing for tv all those late nights in the studio making songs that we would put out and nobody would listen to and nobody like cared about us particularly as musicians but all of that time isn't wasted time in fact it's like the reason that we're able to continue to work this way all of that stuff is so foundational so Working really hard on something you enjoy is never a waste of time. David, if you went back to Brown and you talked to the young David and he's asking you, how did you make it? How did you break through? Uh, what would you say? A reckless belief that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. When I was in college, I went to the Hip Hop Theater Festival in New York one summer. And it was this crazy, amazing sort of spiritual experience. And I have said, that's, that's why I'm doing this. And I didn't know you could do that. I'd never seen anybody do that before. So it gave me permission to go back to school and be like, hey, I want to write this play and I need a band and uh, it's gonna be rapping, it's gonna be, and, you know, by the time I was a senior, they gave me all of these things. I was able to make this total mess of a performance piece. It was terrible and nobody should ever see it, but like, it, it, it was that moment where I was given permission. That kind of permission passing has been really important for me in my career. I love that idea of permission passing that you're sharing. That's such a powerful thought in this moment, in this, what I think of as this very creative era that we're in the midst of. Mm. I think we're at the beginning of a very creative era uh, that excites me, uh, the possibilities. I want to do a little rapid fire with you. You mind if I hit you with a little rapid fire? Let's try. Is there a dream project that you would love to do that would bring you joy? I'm just trying to get another solo album done. I put out a lot of music as my band clipping, but I haven't put out a David Diggs album since 2011. You know the deal, stay black, death and taxes. I should go tap the Sans Fats. If you get that reference, use a nerd like me. Not like Pharrell, my quirks for real. Won't hurt my sales, ain't got a deal. That would be a, a very joyous thing for me. <laughs> Biggest honor, uh, being nominated for a Grammy, a Tony, or an Emmy? Uh, I would say a Hugo my proudest nomination, actually. <laughs> Most interesting person you've met in this life so far? Uh, I mean, Emmy. My, my, yeah, my partner is definitely the most interesting person I've ever met. She's just the kind of brilliant that you don't come across very often. David, if you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would you love to have dinner with? I'm uh, George Clinton. Didn't yeah, expect yeah. that. A little 70s funk, that's good. Parliament and Funkadelic, but really Parliament was my favorite band of all time. I grew up with all of those records and my dad was a huge music fan. David, just thank you. Thank you for giving us this time. Thanks for having me. This is, this is a special one. So. I hope I do get a chance to uh, shake your hand in person one day. We'll, def we'll definitely make it happen. I just so am inspired by people who are constantly creating. The best quote was, the reckless belief that I could do it. There's a crew person I work with who's like a cousin of his. And uh, he talks about, you know, how he's always giving back to the community. So I think that there's, there's a lesson in there about you know, good parents, but also a good milieu that he came up with. Translating what he's learned from like hip hop and putting that into how he approaches uh, character development or like filmography, storytelling in general. Mm -hmm. I think that was super cool. Hey, I really hope you enjoyed David Diggs. What an interesting and talented person. Love what he shared about his parents and all the goodness uh, that they brought to him and it brought to this world. Loved how he talked about his art, not seeing limits on it, knowing that music is connected to performance, is connected to writing, connected to so much more. Love what he talked about in terms of permission passing. That'll certainly stay with me and more. All right, listen, as we begin to wrap up our show, allow me to give a quick shout out to our friends at Kiriuma, who of course have hooked me up with the coolest shoes on the market. In fact, if you want to get yourself a pair, be sure to visit carryuma.com slash Carlos and tell them that Carlos sent you. All right, that's it for us. That's our show. Hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to tune in next time. Be safe. Be well. It's still the night shift, just brighter. Still a night out, but everything fits in. 
Chevrolet, making life's journey just better. We don't know what our kids are capable of because um, their education sometimes is so limiting. Particularly in black and brown classrooms, there's always an emphasis to me on body control. Um, you can go into a very affluent white classroom and the kids are moving around the room and talking and there's lots of activity and you assume that something magical is happening. You go into a black classroom and the kids are moving around and interacting with each other and it's perceived very differently, right? Immediately someone thinks that teacher doesn't have classroom management skills. But I think it's also kind of limiting what we allow our kids to have access to. And we wanna invite students to tell us, what are you curious about? If you have a hook and a kid is really excited about a particular subject, or some sort of content, lean into the things that they do well so they build the confidence they need as students to tackle the things that are a little more challenging. Shockingly, 14 million students are in schools with police, but no counselor, nurse, psychologist, or social worker. And two out of every five students say they feel unsafe with police officers in school, which begs the question, who are they protecting? It would be a better country for all of us if Black children and white children got equal educations and had equal opportunities. So what has the last year done? Because there, there were more conversations about race than I remember in my life during the Black Lives Matter protests. Has that changed in your experience? I think in some ways, obviously, it's better because of awareness, and especially with social media, you know, it has its flaws, but it's bringing things to, like, more attention to important issues. But for me, it kind of feels like it's worse because now I feel like any of my white friends or people at work, they're walking around eggshells around me because they're afraid that anything they're gonna say is offensive. Or when I say, hey, like this is actually a microaggression or this feels kind of ignorant. Like I'm trying to let you know, it's instantly, instead of, hey, I apologize that I did those things and here's how I'm going to change. Now it's like defending, I'm not racist, I'm not like this, I'm not like this and this and that. It almost seems like they feel like the finger is pointed at them and everybody's walking around eggshells and can't have that conversation because they're so afraid to be called out for something negative. Hey, hey.